Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. But now I cannot move. Don't you let you move your slides? No. Don't you love technology? Hmm. Okay. Just... There we go. Okay. Did you do that or did I do that? Um, I don't believe I did. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll find out in the second, the third slide. <laughs> Um, this is a program that I put together um, after years of talking with gardeners. And it was something I'd been thinking about because it seems that as gardeners, we have so much in common with our uh, trials and tribulations and our travels through our gardening experience. So, you know, after talking to gardeners for years, I decided to try to put this into some type of format. And that's where I came up with the program, Ages and Stages of Gardening. There's a delightful book, and I'll share it with you at the end of the program, called Gardening for a Lifetime by Sydney Edelstein. And it's a delightful read, and she really gave me a lot of inspiration as I um, prepared this program. So we're going to go, the first part I call the kind of the expectations of gardening and, you know, our physical our, um, journey as we've been gardening. And then in the end, I'm going to switch over to body smart gardening and talk about some of the, the tools and some things that we, we have at our disposal to make gardening not as strenuous on us as it sometimes can be. You know, I'm a perennial person. I've always been uh, herbaceous ornamentals as a specialty. My mom was a perennial grower. So that's where I start. Because, you know, when you think of the perennial border, you know, what comes to mind? Pictures like this. Pictures of these beautiful um, flowers blooming prolifically from pages of garden magazines and books and catalogs. But do realize that those pictures were taken at the peak of bloom. They were taken with ideal conditions. Uh, sometimes I don't mean to burst any bubbles, but they might be using special camera filters and they might be bringing in a few plants to fill in where there's holes. So, you know, when you look at something like this, you know, do realize that this, this might it, it, I'm sure it looks very, very nice, but uh, when I look at my gardens, I just don't get that, that look all the time. And the thing with a perennial garden that we have to think about is it's constantly changing. Gardens are constantly changing. This garden here is going to morph into the next season. And it's because of that change that it's in a constant state of flux. And that's where we have to start thinking about ourselves as gardeners is what can we take care of? What can we manage? Um, what, you know, what, what are the expectations? And I know I'm preaching to the choir, I'm talking to gardeners, but there's, there's work out there. This spring, it's gonna be cleaning out our beds, cutting back the old growth, maybe getting in and dividing, maybe mulching, fertilizing, deadheading, you know, all those things, but, but we're gardeners. So we anticipate what's going to have, need to be done. So when I look at this, I think, what? I'm trying to change. Okay. All righty. I'm going to have to do something different. Let me open up my laptop again and let's see if we can do it this way.
Did you sign off, Martha? Is she on? So maybe she's. Oh. Hang with us, guys, just a moment. Um, so, Martha, I don't know. You shouldn't have any trouble being a host. And Chris and I are, Chris is a co-host, along with myself, where my name is. And... Chris, do you have a suggestion here? Okay, am I back? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I don't know if you could, everything just went haywire. That's what I was worried about today with the weather we're having. So let me try doing this again. And you have to make me a host again, sorry. Um, I, I have you as host now, Martha. Thank you. I hope this is going to work. Let's... Okay. Let's try this again. Nope, it's not sharing my right. Sorry about this. Not screen one. Okay, what screen are you seeing? A screen one. Screen one with just the picture? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I knew I was going to have trouble today. So I'm going to just advance to where we were. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So as I was saying, you know, with perennials, um, the garden, it, it's morphing, it's constantly changing. So we have to take that into consideration. So it happens to all of us, it does. You know, for me, I started off with large mixed borders full of colors and textures. And a quote that I uh, read once was that, as it turns out, we're all doing the same thing trying to hang on to something that we love. And that's, that's gardening, that's, that's what it is. We also have to accept the fact that gardens age and gardeners age and we all change. Uh, you know, it took a lot of time to get your garden the way that it, that it is. And if you look back and think about the, the time that you spent, you probably loved every minute of being out there. But as we go through, our, our likes and dislikes change, new plants come on the market. So there's, there's lots of things that are just in flux as we go through our journey as a gardener. I love this quote, gardening, the slowest of the performing arts. How true is that? We have these gardens that are morphing from one season into the next. And that's, that's what it is. It's a performing art. It's changing. You could visit one garden in the spring and go back to that garden in the fall and you'd have a completely different feel. So you've got to ask yourself some questions. Gardener, know thyself. Number one is we have to accept imperfection. Do you lay awake and think about what you didn't get done that day? Do you think about all the things that still are on your to-do list? You know, we're our own worst enemy. We have to learn to cut ourselves some slack. The same is with our garden. You know, accept perfection. Mother Nature doesn't go out and clean up every leaf that falls, so we don't have to. 
let the leaves stay where they lie in the fall and they'll break down eventually into mulch or next spring you can rake them off of some of the plants that they might be smothering out. Deadheading, does deadheading have to be a daily task? No, no. Take your tasks and break them into chunks. Away from that, I have to, have to, have to. And I always tell people, take the time and stop and smell your own flowers and learn to appreciate your own seasons in your own garden. Truly analyze your situation. I've come to this realization slowly. I always had this one garden that I, I wanted a certain look. So in my design mind, I was always trying to take this garden and fit it into what I wanted. Finally, after about four years of trying, I realized the problem was me exerting my will onto this location rather than accepting that garden for what it is and its works. So I have now learned to design that garden with that garden site in mind and that garden's own agenda. Also, don't think that you have to fill every inch of a garden with plants. You know, there's nothing wrong with having space and having mulch that shows through. These are some of the things that as I've gone through this uh, process, I've learned about myself. Did you have a wake up call? I made a garden that was beautiful and I was able to keep it looking good for so, so, so many years. But then I had my wake up, wake up call. And that wake up call was a sharp, clear message in my lower back, uh, primarily the lower lumbar region, specifically L4. So I, that was my wake up call and I had to make the decision to change. Saying you're going to change and actually doing it are two different things. You know, the catalogs begin to arrive and all our common sense goes out the window. I find my order, myself ordering stuff thinking, oh, that'll be lower maintenance. And then it all starts to arrive. And I have to come to the realization that now I have to find homes for all of that and I'm going to have to take care of it. So maybe you set goals for yourself and maybe reduce your garden by one side, uh, by, by a third each year for the next three years, or you are going to not increase any gardens in size. So set your goals, set a goal for the next couple of years and then stick with it. You know, you gotta bite the bullet and make that decision and it's a personal decision. But if you look at your garden and you see one particular perennial that somehow started to take over and monopolize, well, maybe it's time to start thinking about how you wanna change that garden. Make lists. I call lists sanity savers and I highly recommend them. I make daily lists, weekly and longer. Not that I'm going to get everything done on that list that day, but it's just to help me remember. So, Let's say this spring you're out in the garden and you see something you want to change, but this isn't the right time of year to do it. So you think, well, I'll start working on that this fall so that everything will be ready in the spring. Well, I don't know about you, but if I don't write that down, <laughs> chances are fall is going to come and go. And next spring, I'm going to see that exact same situation and wish I had remembered to work on it the fall, the fall before. Take pictures. I take lots of pictures, I date them so that I can go look back and see changes over the years, see how things have morphed. And also I like to look at pictures of my garden in January <laughs> because then as those catalogs start to arrive, it's kind of a reality check that um, I really don't need that extra hosta or that extra daylily. Established priorities, what can you realistically manage? What 
area or garden of your landscape do you want to focus your energy? Do you need help with projects? When I gardened in my 20s, I thought, what do I want this garden to look like in five years, 10 years, 15 years? Well, now it's 25 years later. And as I look at the gardens and I love my gardens, I realistically have to say, what do I wanna take care of in five years, 10 years, 15 years and 20 years? So what was your wake up call? And what was your decision to change? And then explore new ways to garden. Here you're seeing some pictures of um, the west side of our home. The upper picture is about maybe five years after we purchased and the spruce split uh, shortly after this. And so this whole side became an opportunity. I wanted to have height, I wanted to have variety, but I really didn't want to bring in another whole slew of perennial borders. So I found these things that I love in my garden. They look good, they take up space, they don't need care, and they're called boulders. So in the lower picture, that's the same um, garden area. Notice we're not filling every single spot. And in some of those areas, we're bringing in boulders for accents. Here's a couple other areas. The one on the um, left is our front corner. Again, boulders, not every spot filled. Yes, there are um, spring bulbs that come in, up in there. And some years I put annuals out there. Um, some years I might just leave it as it is. The picture on the right is a garden on the other side of the house. And it's just height, boulders, different foliage colors, different fo foliage textures. So I went back to when we first moved here and kind of what's happened to the gardens. This was the East Garden. And when we first moved here, that stump that you see was a beautiful American elm, just beautiful. And this was all shade, just a nice shade garden. So for the first six years, it was a shade garden. I had a still bees and a ferns and hostas and epimediums and all of those wonderful shade plants. Well then in June one year, we had 109 mile an hour flatline winds and that beautiful uh, elm twisted and snapped about 20 feet um, above the ground. That's how strong the winds were. Now I had a full sun garden. So the shade garden that I had in my mind suddenly was thrust into a sun garden. So that's when I started to think about how gardens change things that we can control and things that we, we can't control. So here, a few years later, the stump is still in there. You can see that right here. It eventually um, uh, deteriorated. We couldn't cut it to the base because it had grown around a metal uh, fence post. So we had to let it naturally um, deteriorate. So that was a few years later, starting to morph into um, more woodies, less maintenance, still having the color with the herbaceous ornamentals, but bringing in more foliage color. Here about 15 years later, still the perennials are the focus, but as you can see, the trees, the shrubs, everything else is starting to get some size and um, starting to bring back some more of that shade that I originally started with. But that's, that's the journey. That's the journey of one spot in my garden over the course of about 25 years. So think of your wake up call. Gardens begin to become too much to take properly care of, to take care of. Some of my gardens were way back in the corner 
And to get water back to them, it was dragging hoses. If I wanted to work back there, it was dragging equipment and tools. And realistically, I had to think how much can we maintain? How much do we want to maintain? And how much time do we want to spend? You know, maybe some of you are wanting to travel more or maybe spend more time with uh, kids and grandkids, or maybe jobs have changed and your time uh, commitments are now different. And then for me also, it was my aching back and my poor knees. So after talking with gardeners over the year, this was the timeline I came up with. And there's a lot of commonalities with gardeners. We all seem to have gone through these various stages as we um, went through our gardening years. So hopefully some of you can um, identify with some of these. Someone was just saying before we started that they were going to um, start to think about taking out some of their roses. Well, they were looking for something low maintenance. So hopefully this timeline will fit in for you. So I had the mixed flower border. That's what I started with. Um, that's that stump. I don't know if you can see my arrow back in the right back there. So this is the um, east border. And it's the nature of the beast. It's constantly changing. So the lupins bloomed. They came out of bloom. They had to be cut back. Penstemons are coming in. There's always something morphing in and out of change. And they just need care because there's such a variety. You know, you could have a landscape of just one plant. That would be fairly easy to take care of. Such varieties, which is what we want in our gardens, it, um, it, it gets to be a task. So I'm just gonna ask you something. Does this sound familiar? Um, think about when you're out in your gardens this spring. You know, your plants from the spring have bloomed. They're already, they're beginning to look a little ratty, but your summer bloomers are starting to come in and your fall bloomers are just starting to poke up. So you're thinking, what do I have to cut back from my spring? I've got my daffodil, my um, tulip foliage that I want to hide, but then the peonies are coming into bloom and I got to get those hoops around them before they get too big and we have a rainstorm and the flowers end up in the mud. Meanwhile, the sedums and uh, all of our fall bloomers, we have to get our mums cut back and our sedums cut back. And oh my stars, there is that list I created last year and it just keeps going on and on and on. So You've got to stop to remember and smell your own roses, smell your own flowers. And then I had my rose years. I love a rose garden. I do, just not in my backyard. When I had roses, when we first moved here, uh, we received a housewarming gift from a friend who was a Jackson and Perkins uh, sales rep. And he sent us 20 bare root roses. So we had roses in the early years. And I would get black spot, I'd get out in the spring, try to keep it under control, powdery mildew, keeping them fed, keeping them pruned. And then up where I am in the state, you have uh, winter concerns. Then came Japanese beetles, which absolutely love my roses. <laughs> and it just came to the point where, yes, I love roses, but the time to keep them looking good was just beginning to get overwhelming. So after being here as long as we have, I don't, I think I have one rose left and that was it. But I went through those years. Then I had my iris stage. Iris in the spring, they're so beautiful. So we went to a, an iris grower that's up here in the Northern part of the state. They have an iris walk. And you would go and you would pick out which ones you liked, which ones you um, wanted. Then when they would dig them in August, they would ship them. So the special was to get 15. So we picked out 15 and that year they had a bumper crop. So they sent us six extra. So we had 21 different irises to plant. Now, when you plant one particular type of plant, 
If you plant 21 the same year, guess what? You're dividing them and doing all that maintenance at the same time. So there is maintenance involved with your irises. Those of you that grow them know that. So for the first couple of years, everything was great. And then we had to start to think about dividing. And then we had some pests that came in. We had some borers and we had some issues. I think out of those original 21, I, I have about seven left and I enjoy them. I enjoy them. It's just, I moved on. And in my journey, I got into daylilies. And daylilies are relatively easy to take care of. You really, the only thing is deadheading. If you want them to look good, you need to go in and remove the spent flowers. And I'm always leery of gardening friends that have lots of only one type of plant because when they're dividing, they wanna find good homes. And so a lot of times people would bring them over to me. So I ended up with a lot, a lot of day lilies. They're, they're very tough plants, as you know, though, with deadheading. This was a picture that was a garden along a, a thoroughfare. And you can see in order to keep that garden um, visually appealing, first of all, I would have planted it completely differently. I wouldn't have put the early bloomers, mid bloomers and late bloomers, but to keep that visually appealing, you need to go in and deadhead. And then when the flowers are all spent, you need to go in and cut that flower scape back. I also started to have some disease issues and this is leaf streak disease. Maybe some of you have seen this. This is a fungal disease that gets into your um, daily through wounds uh, and you need water. So you may have heard that you should not work in your daylilies when the foliage is wet. Because when you're working in your daylilies and you hear that snap when you have brushed against a leaf and it's broken, and if the foliage is wet and if you have that fungus there, it can get in, into the plant. And once it's in, then it's, it's really nothing you can do about it. What happens is the center begins to die out. And as the center dies out, it stops the flow of food and nutrients to that leaf tip. Then the center completely browns out, dies. Sometimes you end up with a hole and the whole leaf then eventually starts to die back. Uh, certain cultivars are more susceptible. And I had several that I was having problems with. So I originally had to just dig them up and destroy them. Ornamental grasses. How many went through ornamental grasses? Or maybe you're still in your ornamental grass years. I love them. I had lots of ornamental grasses. I loved them through the seasons, especially in the fall when the warm seasons would uh, come into bloom. But they really, really looked great. And I loved them until they needed to be divided. Some of these grasses, they are tough. Now here I'm showing you on the left, that's uh, Miscanthus malapartus. On the right, that is Miscanthus gracilimus. And when the centers start to die out, when they start not to bloom properly, that's a sign they need to be divided. And some of these, you need a backhoe or a Boy Scout troop to help you dig these out. So over the years, I still have ornamental grasses, um, just not as many. I probably had about 30 scattered throughout the landscape at one time. And then came the hosta years. I kind of fought the hosta years for, for a while. I just thought, oh, I don't want to go down that road. But as my gardens started to become more shady again. And the neighbor's windbreak of evergreens started to uh, really dry out that garden because those roots were sucking up the moisture. Pastas worked. Pastas are tough plants and they do well. So I started to move into pastas, but are they labor free? No, no, they're not. 
uh, there's slugs. And you've got to get, if you're going to protect them, and if you use some type of slug bait, you've got to get that out there. Or it's fighting debris in your garden, sanitation, trying not to give them places to uh, escape during the heat of the day. Um, division every so many years. But overall, I have to say, tough plants that I would say are more on the lower maintenance side. But leaf scorch, if they get too dry, get too much sun, and the lower uh, right-hand picture, slugs. Also, in the spring, I don't know about you all, but we get some pretty uh, vicious storms come through here. And just when your hostas are up and getting nice size, you have a hailstorm. And the hail just beats into those leaves, creates holes, and then you have tattered foliage for the rest of the season. So you know, they're, they're low maintenance, but there are, there are some issues. So I want to have low maintenance. I want to have good visual interest and I want to have variety. But now I want plants that are truly hardy. I want plants that will survive up here in our cold temperatures on average of minus five to minus 10 degrees. Um, down where you all are, there's many plants I've tried, but when we have a true Rock'em Sock'em cold northern winter, I usually lose them. I want the plant to possess the fortitude to endure, right? They've got to be able to uh, do their part of the bargain. Okay, I want them to be able to survive when we have some drought, um, if we have some cold snaps. I want them to be able to, to have that, that fortitude to just keep going on. I want good foliage. Foliage is such an important part of design. Our perennials come in and out of bloom, but when we don't have a lot of flower color, if you've designed your garden right, you have foliage color. You've got chartreuse foliage and burgundy foliage and blue foliage. And that's what's going to pull you through those times when your blooms aren't really there. I'd like them to have a tidy habit. I would like them to stay where they're put and not ramble throughout the garden. And I would hope that they wouldn't uh, get so tall and flop over. So something that I know on an average year, I'm not going to have to stake. Um, no known pest problems at the time. I love tall garden flocks, but some of them uh, get powdery mildew really bad in my garden. So I've done the research and I now have David. Flox David is a tall uh, garden perennial that shows good resistance to powdery mildew. Uh, at the time when I planted all those roses, we didn't have the Japanese beetle problem that we now have. So at the time of planting, no known pest problems. And in my garden, three strikes and you're out. That's why delphiniums will never come back to my garden. I had them and after three years, my, my soil is just too heavy. It's too rich. So I've just listed a few on this slide. I'm showing you Lucanthium Becky. Nice perennial. Gives a good visual display. Uh, has a nice upright habit. Uh, Sedum spectabilis. Some of them are your autumn joy. Some of the, the purple leaf varieties. Some of the variegated leaf varieties. Peonies are always dependable. Coreopsis, daylily, and hostas. But when I share this list with people, they say, oh, everybody has those. I want something different. Well, everybody has these because they do well and there isn't a lot of maintenance. So when you think of those plants that you see everywhere, think about what the, what the care is. And you might change your mind about having those in your garden. 
So what I've started to strive for is um, incorporating more woody plant material. This is a garden that it's at Rice Creek. This was a nursery I, I visited. And this is what I would eventually like to have. But as you see, the visual interest there is foliage texture, plant shape, foliage color, and intermittently you can have some blooms. And this will also pull you through the winter and not be as much maintenance. Now, I still have my perennial bed. I can't get rid of that. But we're slowly starting to change over to more woody plant material. Some lower maintenance selections. Think about foliage. Think about foliage color. Barberries. Barberries are tough. And they come in many colors. There's reds. There's deep, deep, um, almost a purple. There's one called Concord. There's now some that have an orange coloration, some beautiful golden barberries. Spireas. Spireas also come in a multitude of foliage colors and have a bloom. Um, ewes. There are ewes that the new growth flushes out bright yellow. There are ewes that have a variegated foliage. And then arborvitaes, junipers, there's a lot to, just, to select from. I like them for a winter effect for the evergreens. And with the deciduous ones, some of them offer me phenomenal spring colors and some offer great fall colors. So think about foliage color, mix them in with your uh, flowers. Think about other attributes. Uh, where I sit here, I'm looking out a window and I see my paper bark maple. And it's just that cinnamon peeling bark. Maybe it has a berry or as I said, a spring flower. Um, if there is a known pest problem at time of purchase, I probably am not going to choose it. But it, it pests come in. I mean, think of emerald ash borer. We didn't have that 20 years ago. And ash was a very popular plant. But if there is something that is known, I'm probably not going to select it. And then do your research and select plants that will work where you live. The other thing, containers. You know, reality says that, you know, as we age, um, we can't do as much. Uh, as we did when we were young. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that that's life. And for me, um, I need a good back with a cast iron hinge uh, so that I can continue gardening. Unfortunately, you know, we all have a love affair with gardening. When my mom was in her 80s um, and in her early 90s, this is what she turned to, were containers. She, she was a gardener her whole life. And here, this was on my deck. This was a sunny um, selection that I planted that year. And I could change it every year. I could move things around. It, it was just a nice spot to go. And um, when my mom came over, she would go out, she would deadhead, she would, she would work in that corner of my deck. But we have some love affairs with our gardens. Maybe you have a peony that came from you know, a family homestead, or maybe the kids planted a tree on Arbor Day that's now, you know, 25 years later. So we do have those plants, but realize there's other ways that we can garden. Container gardening, uh, raised beds, uh, vegetable gardens are great in raised beds and we don't have to bend down as far. Uh, most of them, I have my uh, raised beds are about 24 inches. And I do a lot with window boxes and containers. So I know we have a large group on, so you have to say, what stage am I at? Maybe you're a young gardener that's just starting out. Great. Um, and you're, you're just venturing into your transitional years. You know, maybe you're in your rose years, or maybe you're in your iris stage. But as you go through, stay positive as you transition. And sometimes that big picture has to be replaced with a downsized picture. And 
we want to be able to continue doing what we love. So let's talk about gardening wiser. And this is where we're going to talk about the body smart gardening part of this program. We're going to talk about ways that we can garden that are healthier for us. We're going to talk about clothing, tools, gardening methods. Uh, it, gardening can be you know, such a rewarding activity, but we're outside. We're in the elements. Uh, we're you know, full sun, we're bugs, plants. You know, we have to be able to uh, keep ourselves healthy. One of the most simplest things when we wrote this program years ago, and how many of you actually stretch before you go into the garden? I'm a, I'm a swimmer. And before I get into the pool, I'm stretching, I'm limbering up. But I think absolutely nothing of going out in the garden first thing in the morning and starting to pull weeds, bending over without even thought of, are my muscles tight? Do I, am I gonna, you know, I could end up stretching a muscle and be out for a week. So, you know, think about stretching or doing- I wondered work. what happened. Some type of activity. Um, know your limits. Uh, also, if you are on any medications, you want to consult with a physician before you start any out, outdoor activities. Um, and also, if you're on any medications, you want to uh, make sure that you don't have any hypersensitivity with sunshine, sunlight. You're out in the elements, so you want to drink liquids. You want to wear sunscreen. Think about insect protection. Know the difference between heat sunstroke and heat exhaustion. And most important, listen to your body and pace yourself. That's just good advice for gardeners of all ages. So dermatologists are understandably concerned about sun exposure and potential skin problems, um, melanomas and skin cancers. And gardening is an activity that we're outside. We're, we're naturally going to be outside in the sun. Uh, you can minimize the risk by gardening early in the day. Actually, I prefer to get out earlier, it's cooler. Um, or you could go out at dusk, or you could select spots in your garden that uh, you know when the shade is going to be on that garden, and that's when you could go out and work in that area. When we wrote this program, we had a master gardener who was a uh, dermatologist, Dr. Tice, at Carl Clinic in Champaign. And it was her recommendations that uh, you want to apply your um, sunscreen, excuse me, liberally. You want to have an SPF 30 or above. And she recommended applying it 30 minutes before you went outside, especially people that have fair skin and, and freckles. Uh, even on a cloudy day, 80% of the UV rays can still come through on a cloudy day. Um, also, if you're working with any kids in your garden, try to you know, educate them early on about the importance of protecting their skin and putting on um, sunblock. Caps. I've always been a baseball cap wearer. I just would put a baseball cap and I have short hair, so the top of my ears. So I'm always applying sunblock, top of the ears, back of my neck, and I will reapply it during the day as um, I sweat and it's starting to wear off. Insect bites. Hey, if you're working in the shade and there's mosquitoes, okay, you could wear long sleeve shirt, uh, long pants, um, or you could choose to apply a repellent so that you're not bothered. Uh, if you're stung, uh, you remove the stinger. Uh, it really depends on what bit you. And there are things that you can put on like this after bite, which can help with the itching and also can help um, uh, with uh, possible pain. But you know yourself, if you're allergic, you know what you need to do. Uh, you might have to have an EpiPen or make sure you have a way to communicate, maybe a cell phone or, or something. We're out, we're out in the elements and this is just part of gardening. 
Understand heat stroke, sunstroke, and heat exhaustion. Heat stroke, sunstroke is where your body temperature is rising, but your body is not sweating. So you could have headache, dizziness, your skin is hot and dry, you're not sweating, confusion, disorientation, and rapid heart beating. Um, again, if you're on any type of medication, do check with your physician to see if you have any um, hypersensitivity to sunlight and working outdoors. If someone you're gardening with or yourself feels this, you wanna get indoors, remove yourself into the shade, loosen clothing, uh, if you got a hose, you know, apply some cool water over, run through the sprinkler, fanning. Um, you can also take ice packs and you would put them in the groin area and under the armpits. This is where your, uh, the major blood vessels are closest to the skin. So you are actually cooling the blood down as it's then going to circulate through your body. Lie down with your feet elevated and contact local hospital or doctor seek attention. To do avoid this, do drink plenty of water or there's sports drinks. Again, make sure that sports drinks are something that you can tolerate. Avoid alcohol and caffeine products. Uh, take regular breaks. Uh, set a timer. Set a timer for 30, 45 minutes and then go sit down and enjoy your garden from a distance. Uh, mist yourself or run through the sprinkler or work when it's cooler outside. Now heat exhaustion, your body temperature is, is rising, but you are sweating and your body is reacting uh, to dehydration. So again, you're gonna have, be tired, you're gonna be fatigued, like headed, possibly upset stomach, but here you are excessively sweating and you have to replenish those fluids. So drink water. Again, if you can tolerate a sports beverage, uh, have that. Get to a cool location or you know, sit down, lie down, loosen your clothes. Just be aware of these things. And when you start to feel this, think about yourself, pace yourself. Uh, you're gonna be better, better for yourself in the long run. Gardener safety. You know, we don't want to run with pruners. Remember our parents always said, don't run with scissors. Well, same with gardeners. Uh, carry your tools conveniently yet safely. Um, here, uh, an apron. Uh, you know, you're getting, you're, let's say you're back in the corner of the garden and you forgot that one thing you need. Well, you got to go back and forth and back and forth. Uh, an apron, you could carry easily a cell phone. You could easily carry any um, additional nozzles that you might be needing, pruners, uh, tags for making labels, maybe some small hand tools. Uh, you want to have an apron that is comfortable. It should uh, attach around the neck as well as around the waist. Uh, you don't want it to be too long that it, that it is uh, interfering with walking. Another thing is uh, what I call a bucket buddy. And you take a five gallon bucket and they're the liners that you put in them and they have uh, uh, slips that you slip over the top so that there's pockets on the outside of the bucket and then you have the center of the bucket for that's to keep tools. And you just fill up what you need and you carry that with you so that you don't have to run back and forth and get up and down. The other thing, um, golf bag and cart. Now this one you might find to be a little bit strange, but I actually was uh, teaching this class years ago. It was in Kiwani and there was a lady. She brought in what her husband had purchased for her to carry her tools and equipment around the garden. He had been at a garage sale and picked up a, um, golf bag with the pull along, you know, wheeled cart for like five bucks. And she put her rakes, her shovels, her spade, everything she needed, all of the nozzles. She had everything in that golf bag. 
and she would just wheel that around and wherever she needed to be, that golf cart was there. She actually brought it in that day and showed everyone. So I just had to include that. I thought that was such a good idea. Um, do take a cell phone with you. If possible, work with inside of the house. Um, carry a whistle. And the reason I'm telling you all of this is, especially when you're working by yourself. Um, we had a neighbor many, many years ago who was out pruning some trees and he was not within sight of the house and he fell. And no one knew, they couldn't see him. He had no way of, he wasn't within earshot. And so he was out there for a good while until someone went looking for him. So, you know, a cell phone, so you could contact someone, even something as simple as a whistle so that you can draw attention to yourself. Um, so just some little tips to think about and set a timer. Maybe set it for 30 minutes on a really hot day so that you remind you to go sit in the shade, have a cold glass of water or whatever, uh, and then kind of rejuvenate yourself and get back out in the garden. Clothing, well, let's start with shoes. Sturdy shoes that are suitable for the job. I like footwear that has a good um, uh, sole to it, uh, has good protection for my arch when I'm digging. I like it to uh, fit comfortably. Uh, I really don't care for leather uppers. I prefer more a cloth because they tend to be a bit cooler for me in the summertime. You want to have something that protects your toes uh, when you're hoeing, mowing, chopping, digging. I've seen, and I'm sure some of you have also, seen people out in the garden with flip-flops on or open-toed sandals, and things can happen. Things can happen. I'm showing you here some of the popular uh, rubber or rubber plastic uh, slip-on shoes, clogged type shoes, or you might have Crocs. I, I like these when I'm out just maybe running to the compost pile or just you know, going out to maybe pick some something that I need in the kitchen, maybe some herbs or some vegetables, but I don't like to work with these on in the garden. Inevitably, I'm bringing out a hose, I'm watering, and if these get wet, they get slippery. And you can slip right out of these pretty easy. You twist an ankle, fall, which would probably be what I would do. So I, I don't recommend um, using these. Yes, they are easy to clean. Yes, when you're working in mud, but they, they can be um, slippery, especially when they're wet. So everyone has their personal preference. I, I just prefer a good uh, work boot with a cloth upper. Gloves. Gloves can be a gardener's best friend. However, it's personal choice. There's so many that are out there. Gloves should fit snugly. Uh, you want to be able to have uh, enough room so that you can comfortably move your fingers. You don't want gloves that are too big because then you can lose your grip. If, you, if they're too large, you can slip. Uh, I like gloves that are breathable. Leather gloves are wonderful for certain projects, but leather gloves uh, do breathe, but they're hard to clean. So I like a cloth glove that I can wash. I want them to be able to absorb moisture. Um, my hands are sweating, I'm in the garden watering. I don't know if anyone uses like latex gloves, but for when I use the latex gloves, my hands, they just sweat. And by the time I pull them off, my hands are just soaked. So here, these are just some pictures of some common gloves. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, sorry about that. Up here, this is that common cloth on one side and then it has the little nubbies for gripping on the palm side. Here, this is um, a leather bottom, but the top is a, a breathable cloth. Here you have um, thicker fabric underneath 
and then a lighter fabric on top. And these are the popular, this is what I prefer to use are, I call them, they're, they're like dipped where the, the, the palm and the fingertips um, are protected from moisture with uh, usually some type of rubberized coating and the back is uh, breathable and they're washable. I will usually wash them and then hang dry them on um, my lines. So there's lots of different types of gloves. You probably have your favorites. Um, just remember, clean them periodically, especially if you're using um, any chemicals so that, they, that, they, that chemical doesn't accumulate. And also just to um, help keep the grip better. Gardener's clothing. Now, when I'm out in the garden, I, I'm really not a, a fashionista in the garden. It's usually sweatpants and a t-shirt and a ball cap, but there are um, gardening clothes and I'm noticing them more and more in the um, catalogs. Um, what we found was that there were some sun protective uh, clothing items out there, which actually protect from the UV rays. Uh, many, many of these materials actually would have an SPF factor, a sun protection factor. Now, if we were doing this face to face, I have all of this in a, in a kit that I bring. It's a big tub and I would have things that I could pass around to show all of you. But with the sun protective clothing, it's a tighter weave that doesn't allow the uh, sunlight and UV rays to penetrate as readily. So when you hold it up to a light, you're not gonna see a lot of light penetrating through it. And in these uh, garments, they will have ventilation um, slits, uh, usually in the arms, maybe uh, under the arm, along the back, just so that, uh, to, to keep you a little bit cooler. They sometimes uh, will come with specific washing instructions. So if you have these, uh, do read and follow whatever label instructions uh, come with it. They also have pants uh, that you can wear also. Some of these uh, are impregnated with um, an insecticide. And this would um, keep you from you know, any of the bugs and mosquitoes. And I thought this was a little bit strange, but then when I realized the forestry industry they're out in the woods constantly, and they use these um, uh, in insecticide protective uh, clothing. They use it quite a bit. Again, if you have these, you want to read and follow the label instructions and do realize that over time, the um, insecticide content does diminish. Uh, some of the uh, Brands that are out there, when we were doing this, there's one called Sun Grubbies. There was Kula Bar. I think if you just Googled uh, sun protective clothing, uh, you'd be surprised what you find. A hat, a hat with a good brim, uh, so that not only ears, but the back of your neck um, are protected. A lot of these are breathable, so you're not gonna you know, feel like you're getting overheated by wearing a hat. So just some things to think about as you're, as you're going out into the garden. And then we get to garden gadgets and oh my, there's a lot of gadgets out there. The first rule is choose the right tool for the chore. If you're using your hand pruners and you're trying to cut a limb, it's not gonna work. Sometimes we get out and we're, we're trying to cut something that's just a little too big for that, that pruner. And if we've got to twist our hand to try to get it through, first of all, we're not doing a, a good job for that plant by twisting it and we're probably creating more of a wound. And also that's a uh, fatigue and wear and tear on your wrist. Uh, spades and shovels, there, there's a difference. Spade is shorter, it has a flat bottom and they're used for different reasons in the garden. A hose, they're not meant to dig into the soil. A hoe is usually something that's just designed to go just under the soil line 
to um, separate the roots of a weed from the upper portion of the weed. The gentleman that's uh, pruning above his head in this picture, those loppers actually have extensions on them. And so rather than taking a ladder or something that he would have to stand on and possibly fall, these handles, you would just unscrew them and they would extend another 18 inches. So there's, there's lots and lots of gadgets that are out there. Find the right one for the job. Pruners, another very personal decision. Uh, you want the right size for the right hand. Uh, did you know pruners are available in small, medium, and large? And there are pruners for left-handed gardeners and right-handed gardeners. Sometimes when you look at pruners, you know, they can get pretty pricey, but um, I inherited the pruners my mom had for 40 years. As long as you keep them clean and keep them sharp, a lot of these um, higher end pruners, you can buy replacement parts. On this pair here, there's that little ratchet in the center. You can unscrew this, take it apart, clean it, oil it, and you can then get a sharpener, sharpen it, get everything back uh, nice and clean, put it back together. Those pruners are good to go. So there's, there's many brands that are out there. Um, uh, Snapcut, Felco, uh, Friskers, there's, there's many that are out there. And again, personal choice. But you know, if you've got a gardener that has a very large hand, consider maybe a large pruner uh, or an extra large to make the job easier for them. How many of you have been out in the garden and set down a garden tool and then can't find it? I had a black handled pair of pruners, little hand pruners. I set them down. I didn't find them for two years because the black handle, they just melted right into the mulch, found them a couple years later. Uh, they were a bit rusty, took them apart, cleaned them, uh, oiled them, sharpened them. I also should tell you right here, this little part here on the pruners, that is replaceable. Sometimes that gets rusted. Uh, so I just purchased a new piece and they were good to go. So if you have that happen, think about purchasing pruners that have a bright handle. A lot of them are red orange. Or if you have dark colored gardening tools that tend to get lost, get some of the brightly colored duct tapes that are now available and put that around the handle. Or as one gardener shared with us, they would just put a, a, a bright colored bandana or something around them. I like for my pruners, I like the belt holder. That's what I'm showing you there. This is designed to slip through your belt and I wear it so it's on my back right hip. It also has a clip on the back where you would clip it onto a back pocket. And it's, it's just always there. Once you get into the habit of putting it there and having it there, it is so convenient. Um, some of our gardening pants, some of our cargo pants now have those very convenient side pockets that are deeper that we can put our pruners in. More gadgets. Uh, here I'm showing you those loppers and I'm showing you how they extend. But I also wanted to um, just point out that these have a foam rubber grip. It's, it's kind of a spongy foam. And this is to help with, with holding, with gripping. It's not going to fatigue your, your hands to try to hold onto that tightly. So some tools will come with that. Now the picture on the other side, this was just a, a shovel. And what this gardener did is they went to a, a home store and that was what you use to insulate pipes like water pipes coming into your house. That was nothing more than a um, foam rubber of some sort sleeve that you would slit and then wrap around your pipes to keep them from freezing. Well, this gardener was using it to have a better grip on his um, garden shovel. 
So there's, there's lots of things out there. Wands and hoses, different types. I, I like the wands. Um, I have several, depending on the job. Uh, you might have um, overhead baskets that are much easier to reach with a garden wand like you see in the upper left, uh, or hard to reach areas that you have to lean over to reach. You can get them in various lengths, various colors. I really like to have this um, uh, nozzle attachment on the end of my hose. In addition to my um, uh, wand or whatever device I'm using, this is a shutoff valve. So if I'm out in the garden and I wanna switch out, maybe I'm done using my watering wand and I wanna put a sprinkler on, well, do I have to run back to the house, turn it off, run back to the hose, switch, run back and turn it on? No, I just take that little um, uh, nozzle attachment, turn off the water, change out what I need to change out and uh, turn the water back on again very inexpensive. You can purchase those at um, home centers. Soaker hoses. Um, some people have a love-hate relationship with soaker hoses. I like to use um, soaker hoses in areas where I'm not going to be doing a lot of um, digging and working around. Uh, I like to use them in landscape situations where uh, I'm having, I use more woody ornamental plants because they're not expanding as quickly as some of our perennials do. Uh, and how they work is you put them in vicinity of the root zone of the plants and hook it up and turn the water on. And then the water pressure builds and the water slowly oozes out. But don't think you can just leave these on for about five, 10 minutes. You want to make sure that that's soaking into the ground. And sometimes, depending on how dry the soil is, that can take a couple hours. I don't know how many of you have used those coils that they're showing on the lower um, right-hand side. I've had people that, that love using them, and I've had people that find them very difficult, um, especially when it comes to wrapping them up and um, trying to keep them stored so that they're not um, in the way uh, of possible tripping. But you all have your favorite nozzles. What we really uh, don't recommend are those, uh, remember the nozzles that are just like a gun where it's just got that, that lever and it's just like a little gun nozzle coming out. Some of those when you're watering, because you're holding it so tightly, it's actually wear and fatigue on your hand. So I like to use the nozzles that have um, either a turn on and off valve or a very gentle um, uh, pressure nozzle to get the water going. Then we had the craze with all the ergonomic tools. Ergonomic um, does not mean it's easier. Ergonomic is to maximize the muscle use and to avoid strain. And there's a lot of tools. These were really, really popular about 10, 15 years ago. And uh, they are designed for uh, taking stress off of certain um, parts of the body. The ones that you're seeing that are yellow, this has, a, this keeps happening, I apologize. This you put in and the, rather than the pressure of using that handsaw on your wrist going back and forth, the pressure is back here and the movement of sawing is actually coming from your whole arm. So it's not making it easier. It's just putting um, different muscles to use and taking the wear and tear off of the wrist or if you have any carpal uh, tunnel issues. So there's lots of ergonomic tools. Uh, some of you might have some of the rakes like you see in the um, upper corner that have the bend in the handle. And this is designed so that using it, you're not so much bending over at the waist, you're staying straight and you're letting the rake or whatever the tool is do the work. 
How many of you have thought of something like this? I know we have our knee pads out there. These are, you'll find them at the home stores. This is what roofers use, tilers use, and they're great. I don't know about you, but if, when I'm on my, in the garden on my knees and you hit that rock and right on your kneecap or you're working on a hard surface, these, these are really nice. And I, I've used these over the years. And as we want a garden wiser, we don't want to do a lot of unnecessary bending. So we have uh, little stools that we can use. That's what we're showing you there. That one's on wheels. Some of you might have kneelers that you're using. When you're doing a chore, you don't want to reach, move to the chore. And I've seen people, I do it. When I'm raking in the fall, I will stand in one spot and I will rake in every direction to bring it to me, bending out as far as I can go. Move to the chore, don't reach, because that's just a stress and strain on your back. Trying to keep the center of gravity close to your body. So move to the chore and don't reach. And the final thing is consider how you move through your garden. Consider your edgings. Um, you don't want to have raised edging. That could be a toe catcher where people could easily trip and fall. Um, if, I, again, when my mother was aging in the garden, when we would go on garden tours or garden walks, uh, it was very difficult uh, to get her with her walker through um, stone mulch. So in her garden, we made sure that we had clear pathways and places that she could easily get to and not worry about tripping, tripping and falling. So I hope you've gotten something out of the program today. Uh, you know, know yourself. Think about all the things we talked about. You have to, you know, accept imperfection, recognize what the situation is. Maybe you've had a wake up call. Maybe you can do something to prevent that wake up call then make the decision to change lists, pictures, establish priorities, explore new ways to garden, and do it safely and stay healthy. So that's the program. This is the book that I was telling you about earlier, Gardening for a Lifetime by Sydney Edison. Just an easy read, nice, easy to follow, uh, and how she went through her gardening. So with that, if there's questions, I'm, I'm available. Oh, Martha, thank you so much. Um, last year, our Spring Flings uh, theme was gardening for a lifetime based on this book. Oh, really? And so of course, with COVID, we had to cancel. So we really appreciate you reminding us what a special book that is. It is. Um, there's not a lot of questions, but there's a lot of comments. So somebody actually asked, and you may not remember your first slide, there was a dark blue flower in it, and they were interested in knowing what that was. Oh, geez. I, know. I know. So that's just one while you're thinking of that, if you can recall the photo, and then I'll look through here. Um, some people are commenting about definitely doing journals, taking notes, mm -hmm. um, so you can do your planning. Um, I don't know if this is research-based or not, but uh, somebody says coffee grounds around the base of your uh, slugs. Uh, your hostas keep the slugs away. So I don't know if you want to make a comment on that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going back to that first slide. Okay. So I think. Share my screen again. Okay. And let me see if I can get this back. What? Blue. Huh. Was it sage? Well, Where's I saw it? the sage in the front, but I think it's the one that's behind the sage. Oh. Okay, here, this is Russian sage. Yeah. Here is Joe Pieweed. Yeah. Oh, Joe Pie, okay. Eucatorium. And this, what I believe that to be, is Verbena boneriensis. Um, it's an annual for me. It reseeds readily. Um, that's the only name I know it by. Okay. Well, if it's that tall one, and I think it is, that Joe Pieweed is a native, and they do have a, a variety that's smaller than that. So I know the person who wrote that, you can get that in a couple different size ranges. 
Yeah, um, you're probably thinking of Gateway. Gateway, when it was introduced, um, was supposed to be shorter. Uh, my Gateway didn't read its label. Oh, okay. Where, where that I, happens, doesn't it? Where I put it, it also got a lot of water, and water can push extra growth. But there is another one that's out called Little Joe. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, Little Joe. That one stays in my garden between three and a half to four feet tall. And that one's going to be nice for you guys for pollinators. Yes. Um, a physical therapist told one of our clients here on call today about stretching after you do an activity. Okay. Um, I think before and after is probably a smart smart move, not just after. You know, I I that was just like a, a, a aha duh moment when we were wor working on this. It's like you know you when you're going to go out and do some athletic, you usually stretch. Well, gardening is athletic. Mm -hmm. Um, so heat stroke, we hear that every summer and I know a lot of people just kind of fluff it off, but unfortunately Mary Fisher lost her grandfather at age 49 with heat stroke doing a very small amount of workout in the garden. So it can happen to any age group. Mm -hmm. So those, those, we appreciate those extra comments you made about the heat stroke. Uh, Steve Newton, he uses a tool backpack when, they work, when he's working so he can take it with him and then not have to carry it. Yep, that's a good idea. Somebody has an Apple Watch that will detect if you fall. So for those that are high tech out there, yeah. and uh, you're it, away from you don't you're not gardening as a team. Yeah, um, there's also they can take care you know uh, monitor your heartbeat and all of that stuff. So yeah, yeah, technology. Technology. This isn't this isn't your father's garden, isn't that what they say about a car? <laughs> <laughs> We've got more tools than we than we know what to do with now, but they're very, they're they're there to help us out. So take advantage if you can. Um, uh, lots of good comments for you about the uh, really enjoying the pictures of your garden, and uh, we can't thank you enough for taking the time to share with us today. Well, um, I apologize for the beginning, but I yeah, you know, that's what I was of with the weather and I'm yeah up. the weather and sometimes we're all using multiple screens and stuff but however we're just so grateful that you spent some time with us today and uh all you folks that stayed on till the end here we appreciate that mm -hmm. and uh thank you again martha you have my email if people have specific questions they can always email me and i'd be be happy to answer all right and i did share um the handouts so um We'll get, if anybody has any further questions, everybody's information's on there. So thank you for that offer. All right, everybody take care and be safe out there. If there's any wicked storms coming your way, um, be safe.